Thank you very much, everybody, for taking the time to attend our event, New CO2 Emission Standards for Heavy Duty Vehicles, Enabling uh, Climate-Friendly Road Freight Transport. And I'm very thankful that Jens, Bertha, Andrea, and Dirk will also participate and give you some insights of um, their work and into this subject. Heavy duty transportation is a backbone of trade and commerce in Europe. 73% of all freight transported by land in the EU is carried by trucks. Unnoticed and taken for granted by most of us, complex and interlocking supply chains ensure that, first, of course, our supermarket shelves are stocked, our online purchases find their way to our doorsteps from Milan to Malmö with just a few days, and pe people don't think about that, that huge rotor blades arrive safely at the offshore wind farms on our coasts. And that's necessary as well. As a result, however, heavy duty transport is responsible for nearly one third of the EU's road transport CO2 emissions. To tackle this issue and to reduce the carbon footprint of trucks and buses, the revision of the CO2 emission standards for new heavy duty vehicles will be of key relevance. The regulation currently under discussion in the European Parliament and the Council provides an opportunity to boost renewables and replace fossil fuels. Refracting the greenhouse gas saving potential of renewable fuels in the regulation would give truck manufacturers a wider range of emission reduction solutions to meet the new stricter CO2 targets. After all, the Commission's proposal, published on 14th of February this year, requires truck manufacturers to reduce the fleet average CO2 emissions of their new heavy duty vehicles by 45% on fleet average by 2030 compared to 2019, by 65% from 2035, and finally by 90% from 2040. Without a revision of the outdated focus on tailpipe emissions, Manufacturers will only be able to choose between electrification, hydrogen fuel cells, or hydrogen combustion engines to meet these stricter targets. But all these technologies are highly dependent on enabling conditions such as the rapid EU-wide rollout of charging points and hydrogen refueling stations. So what we want to discuss with you today is, what does the commission proposal mean to those affected? How must the regulation currently under revision be amended to give road freight transport flexibility and choice in defossilization? Because that's what we want to have as goal and not the electrification as the only possibility. And why can renewable fuels play a decisive role in moving towards this goal? I'm delighted to welcome our distinguished panelists from the European Parliament and key stakeholders along the value chain to shed some lights on these important issues. And of course, I also look forward to your questions, of course, to you, your audience. We have a lot to cover, so let's start without further ado. And I hand over to Ralph, who will introduce the panelists and then the panelists will start and give some insights. Thank you very much, much all together. All right. Um, thank you very much, Monica, um, for this kind introductory uh, remarks, and also from my side, a warm welcome uh, to all of you. Very happy to have you. We have we are touching 150 uh, participants now, uh, and as Monica already said, we uh, we will go uh, on without further ado. Maybe one remark first. If you have any questions uh, which you want us to be uh, risen towards them, uh, the the speakers. Uh, just use the um, uh, F and A uh, button on the uh, downward um, menu uh, and ask a question and maybe also please add to whom uh, you want to direct your question and I will try to pass it forward then, uh, right away. As Monica already said, we have uh, uh, Jens Giesecke, um, a member of the European Parliament um, uh, from the EPP group with us. Um, uh, very happy uh, to have him. Um, uh, he's coming originally from uh, Lower Saxony, with it, which is uh, a part, a northern part uh, of Germany. He's a lawyer, 
by profession. He used to work in uh, the Brussels area for a long, long time already when he was uh, before he entered uh, the European Parliament. Um, and he's now in the European Parliament in uh, his second term and um, is uh, mainly involved into transport and environmental issues. So he was shadow rapporteur already in the Environmental Committee on the CO2 targets for, tri uh, for uh, cars and vans. And he is also the shadow rapporteur on this file, uh, which we are discussing today, um, uh, the CO2 targets for trucks. Uh, very well, welcome, Jens. Happy to have you. And maybe you could give us a, a first um, uh, impression of uh, A, what you think about the Commission proposal, and B, how you judge the situation is in the European Parliament. Uh, we remember we had uh, quite heavy debates on the car uh, file. Um, will that be different in the truck file, or uh, what is your judgment there? You have to unmute yourself, Jens. Okay. I hope now it works. Perfect. Yeah. Okay. So thank you, Ms. Griefan. Thank you, Ralph, for the invitation and for the kind introduction. Um, so let me straight go into the point. My opinion has not changed. Um, I continue to believe that we as Europeans should follow a technological open approach in our legislation and policy should not limit the choices of companies on their way to decarbonization. So I liked it very much when Ms. Griefan in her introduction uh, talked about flexibility and choice. This is something which is really needed. I believe policy should ensure that there is fair competition for the best and most efficient solution and it shows the rules of the games toward emissions reductions. Basically, this is also the goal of our new European legislation. The legislator sets reduction targets to be achieved by market operators. The manufacturers find their way on achieving these targets. But our current CO2 legislation, be it for cars or for trucks, has a fundamental problem. By focusing only on tailpipe emissions, we exclude technologies from the very beginning. The way we assess CO2 emissions is no longer up to date. We can only achieve real comparability by looking at life cycle emissions. Unfortunately, the Commission lacks the courage to tackle this fundamental problem. This is deeply regrettable. You know very well that the Commission has a mandate to look into this life cycle assessment since the regulation from 2019 for cars. But since then, we did not make any progress. Um, as Parliament, we have strengthened the existing mandate to the Commission to life cycle analysis for passenger cars. And in the remission, this has now entered into force. Unfortunately, we have no choice but to hope that the Commission will finally take this mandate seriously and deliver it by 2025, and thus before the next revision in 2026. For MEPs who nevertheless want to have legislation that is open to technology, this means one thing above all. All systems must be designed that eradicate this fundamental error. In the case of CO2 standards for cars, I introduced a voluntary credit system for synthetic fuels in order to make this legislation at least somewhat more open to technology. Unfortunately, a wave of sin majority supported by Greens, Social Democrats and Liberals spoke out against this proposal. And that brings me to a second part uh, of the situation in the European Parliament. On CO2 cars, a clear boundary between the political groups emerged relatively quickly in negotiations. On the one hand, Greens, Social Democrats, and a large part of Renew. On the other side, Christian Democrats, Conservatives from ECR, and the smaller parts of the Liberals. But to note this very well, because this is very political, the German liberals from Renew, they were all on our side when it came to technology neutrality. We all know how it turned out in the end. The anti-technology side prevailed, and that was a pretty one-sided approach. From 20, 2035, only battery electric vehicles will be allowed in the EU. The unprofessional revolution of Transport Minister Wissing has not changed this so far. For CO2 heavy-duty trucks, the starting position is quite similar, perhaps even more difficult. With Yannick Yadot, we have a green rapporteur from France, 
and you always know the storytelling of being more ambitious. Um, but this being more ambitious, having even um, tighter thresholds, uh, neglects realism and feasibility. So these negotiations will certainly be a big challenge, especially um, since Mr. Yano, Mr. Yano knows that social democrats and big parts of Renew on his sides. Similar to the CO2 car revision, I will try to win over as many MEPs as possible to have a technology open approach. And uh, this has to be seen because as you know, we have the Euro 7 discussion in parallel and with the heavy duty trucks, we are um, a bit later in the process. So let me, let me summarize if it comes to um, carbon neutral, neutral fuels. I made the experience not to have the victory in the CO2 standard cars and vans. Um, now we have several proposals in recognizing that choice and um, uh, what, what flexibility and choice is an option. So we have to see whether it might be an option to have 100% carbon neutral uh, fuel per definition or to retable the amendments from the crediting scheme, but this had not been successful with the cars or to have a carbon correction factor. And then this is something which I want to discuss with you from my perspective. Of course, for me as member of parliament, it's difficult uh, to table an amendment. Uh, you can table it, but of course you want to win it and want to have a realistic chance to have the majority. And if I hear then divided voices from industry, that makes things really difficult. And uh, there were some OEMs pa in parallel like uh, the CO2 standards and car, uh, by, by cars. Um, the industry was divided. And now I have certain um, truck manufacturers like Scania or Mercedes, and they say all electric, it's feasible. Um, ASEA is not giving real good signals uh, for this renewable uh, fuels. From the industry side, perhaps uh, IRU is some, somehow going in this direction to have this open technology approach. My plea is uh, if we decide on an option to recognize renewable fuels, the industry should be as united as possible. Otherwise, it will be a 50 50, and uh, we will have the same result like in the CO2 standard cars and vans. So, Therefore, let's discuss on options, how to best achieve the technology open approach and then have a fair chance to really get through with it. Otherwise, it will just be a battle and, and this battle will be lost a second time. And I come from the sports, uh, I'm, I'm a soccer player and I do not like to, to lose a second time. So if we, if we start this battle, the second time we should win, that should be uh, the option because I do believe uh, in technology openness still. Thank you very much, Jens, for this clear uh, uh, statement. Maybe um, uh, if I may, just one question uh, right in, uh, in, the, uh, in the aftermath to that. I mean, clearly we, are, we have the problem that um, uh, systematically the CO2 regulation for trucks is basically the same uh, tailpipe approach as the car regulation, as you stated. On the other hand, I mean, I would say there is one big difference uh, in this de debate, uh, and that's the um, basically the customers, right? Uh, I mean, uh, most or nearly all of the trucks running in Europe are owned by fleet owners or by companies. Um, we will uh, come to that later, um, uh, also a little bit more into detail. So it's basically a B2B business for truck manufacturers towards them. Um, and um, uh, uh, my my question to you would be now: Is this perceived in the European Parliament? Because I mean, it's much more about costs. Um, uh, and at the end of the day, if the costs in the transport uh, value chain are getting too expensive, then all the products which are transported getting more expensive, of course. And I would say that's a big difference um, uh, compared to the to the car regulation. Is this perceived? Uh, in your opinion, also from, so to speak, the other side, uh, politically spoken, um, uh, or uh, should we uh, stress that maybe? Uh, thank you. Thank you, Ralph, for that question. I think uh, the difference in the market setup is, of course, a very important feature. We have always the argument of price efficiency and long-term planability. 
but you are very right. Um, the users of those cars, uh, they should uh, raise their voice perhaps a bit louder. Uh, from my perspective, it is more the OEMs and producers. They say it's all feasible. We will go to zero, zero emission uh, trucks even earlier. Uh, but the end user um, is not that loud in the process. So perhaps it's, it's, it's important to, to make this perspective uh, more vital in Brussels because otherwise uh, it gets a bit one-sided. Um, so uh, if, the, if the associations of, of those uh, users of those trucks uh, could be a bit, bit more act active, that would perhaps uh, help in the process uh, to see that there is uh, a other side of the coin as well, and not just um, the the Euro cities, uh, which say we will have uh, electric buses in uh, 2030 already, and we do not need uh, trucks which have emissions uh, from uh, renewable fuels. So this is a valid point. And from my point of view, I don't know if other MEPs have different experience. I haven't uh, heard those, um, those positions uh, so often so far. Um, all right, thank you very much. Uh, there are two questions coming in from uh, the audience concerning biofuels. Um, uh, a very easy uh, or a very general one, uh, will biogas be recognized as e-fuel? Um, uh, and secondly, um, uh, uh, in general, the uh, availability of biogas or bio LNG, if you will, or other biofuels uh, is of course much better uh, or is actually possible right now compared to e-fuels. How, how is your opinion on, on these fuels uh, and the inclusion of, uh, uh, of them in the future also into the regulation? So we, we have to, as I stated in the, in, in the introduction, we have to check how to define the um, carbon neutral fuels. And they have to be 100% carbon neutral, neutral fuel, uh, fuel. Um, so if uh, we have biofuels which, which can um, be that per definition, they should be uh, uh, recognized as carbon neutral fuels. I think this is possible. Um, on the question of, of quantity, of course, you have to check uh, where you use those biofuels. Um, but uh, the question of availability should be defined by market operators. And uh, there will be quantities to a certain price and then they will be bought in the market. So uh, there's always a saying, do not recognize uh, biofuels in, uh, in, in transportation because those kind of certain fuels we do need for aviation or for shipping. Uh, this is not the approach we should have if we, are, if we have market economy. Uh, the final decision is made by the consumer and not by the regulator. So uh, there should no, from that point, there should not be any limit. All right, thank you very much for that. Um, uh, you stated already, uh, or you commented already on the uh, uh, German uh, and German-led co uh, co German coalition uh, intervention on the, on the car file uh, on a very late state, uh, stage in the council. Now, um, I would assume that we all agree, uh, or that we would agree that from a content perspective, um, uh, aiming for a possibility for e-fuels also post-2035, this was correct. On the other side, we also, and that is what you stated, we understand that uh, the intervention to such a late stage um, was um, uh, harming a little bit, let's say, maybe reputation. Um, how do you judge, uh, or, or do you have a judgment on, on what that means for the truck regulation? Does this affect um, uh, the discussion uh, around trucks, or uh, would you say there is no impact? Um, of course, there was this uh, pretty um, late intervention from Mr. Mr. Um, Wissing, and the problem in, in that procedure was that for Germany, uh, in the lead in the lead ministry, Ms. Lemke stated for Germany, uh, we are in favor of a ban of the combustion engine, neglecting the dispute in Germany. So finally, this led to the uh, abstention of Germany and to the veto. Um, I think that Germany lost has lost trust in the in the procedure because now 
the, the, uh, in the council working group, the, the members say, well, uh, is it really something we can count on Germany or will there be a very uh, late intervention of Germany? So in a way, uh, the German position is, is weakened. Um, but to make one thing very clear, uh, this dispute still exists between Greens and Liberals. And so they should, uh, uh, the Greens should not now uh, go uh, do, do the same mistake and say we are in favor of a 100% reduction and, and no um, recognizing of any renewable fuel, uh, because this would lead to a uh, abstention of Germany again. So we should be uh, motivate the German position to to come early with this clear positioning that there is that there is no clear positioning. The problem is that we have the German vote, and this German vote means abstention. Uh, but this is uh, the only thing that Germany could deliver. So. We should not uh, do this uh, mistake a second time, pretending that Germany approves something. And finally, we have this intervention. Uh, one last word to this procedure. We all wait now for the implementation of the delegated act. That what Wissing and Timmermans uh, negotiated internally, but nothing happened from the Commission side. So really, uh, in Germany, Mr. Mr. Wissing uh, celebrates the liberals for saving the combustion engine, but the reality is in Brussels, nothing happens. So uh, this is a very poor result. And uh, we should see that uh, in, in Germany under the progress coalition, there is no, no clear positioning if it comes to the heavy duty trucks as well. Uh, so um, we have, that is important in US 7 we have already eight member states not willing to have any compromise uh, and Germany can just abstain so this will be something in the procedure which is difficult because one thing this is something I want to make very clear I think it's not just the heavy duty uh, trucks the CO, the CO2 standards but at the same time we need planning security with US 7 so if there is one piece missing uh, the industry has a real problem because then the new rules will uh, be implemented in 2025. So let's have a smooth procedure for both, for US 7 and for heavy duty uh, trucks, and then we can implement a package approach. But this is not easy because in Spain we have votes and in uh, next year in um, 2024, we have just three months under Belgian presidency to finalize both files. All right, thank you for that. There is one other question coming from the um, uh, from the audience, uh, which uh, I find uh, interesting because that's uh, indeed a difference uh, uh, concerning the Commission proposal for trucks compared to the cars. Uh, with the car regulation, the, pro the Commission proposed 100% minus CO2 emissions, so basically zero emissions in 2035. Uh, in terms of trucks, the Commission went only uh, to 90%. Um, uh, and that would, uh, so, that, so that's the question from the audience. Uh, doesn't that or wouldn't that leave room for other, all, basically all technology or other technologies? So what's your take on that? Would you follow the commission in that respect? Uh, because we know there are also others around in the European Parliament who would like to go for it. Of course, we know very well that there was this fight on the to have the same 100% uh, reduction for 2045. And uh, finally, Timmermans uh, was not successful in having the 100% for 2045. Uh, but my point is that we really need clarity on what we accept as renewable fuel. And therefore, we need a definition. If we have that, uh, we can uh, have even an earlier uh, reaching of the targets of carbon neutrality. Uh, if, if the fuels are recognized as carbon neutral. So uh, the 90% is, is the first step in the right direction. Um, but nevertheless, we do need the, cl the clarity and the definition uh, of what is uh, renewable fuel, which is accepted under the regulation. Thank you very much. Um, uh, and then we have another question from Indonesia, from really Salim. So uh, we are really an uh, in, in an international global call today. Um, uh, what is the lesson learned from losing the first vote on CO2 emission standards for cars and vans? Um, uh, what would be the supporting conditions to win this match uh, on the truck regulation? 
you partly referred to that already, but maybe we can elaborate a little bit. As you know, but uh, lessons learned is difficult uh, because it was a very tight race and, and I lost uh, the decisive um, votes on the crediting scheme uh, for less than 12 votes. So that was really very close. And you have to see that in the environment of the global approach uh, on Fit for 55, uh, things begin to change. Uh, we have, for example, the nature restoration law, um, which is one part of this Fit for 55 package. And we had votes against it in fisheries committee and in agricultural committee to have a more realistic approach, to be open for, for industry, for, for, for the, finally, for the, for the people who have to implement the legislation. If it comes to nature, ration, nature restoration law, the farmers. So lessons learned is that in the process, something changed. Um, there was a pretty one-sided approach of Fit for 55, but we have to see that after two years after publishing uh, the Fit for 55 proposals, the, the commission comes with an um, industry strategy uh, to um, make uh, in, um, uh, industry strategy accompanying the, the Fit for 55 package two years later. So we have to see that we are successful with Fit for 55 to uh, account the, the, the needs of industry and of the people really delivering on the ground. So I think that in the process, something changed. It's not just one sided. We want to just be climate neutral. We want to be economically, from the economic point of view, successful as well. So this is something where I'm pretty optimistic then, that we can have a majority on those amendments. And uh, this is, uh, so lessons learned will be to lose one time, try again, and then be successful. Okay. Um, uh, maybe uh, one question concerning infrastructure, because I know you was also uh, involved into uh, the discussions um, uh, in the European Parliament in that respect. I mean, clearly, uh, when it comes to uh, charging infrastructure for e-trucks, especially long-haul e-trucks, uh, that's a specific challenge because we need uh, a lot more energy and grid um, uh, enabling uh, and not only charging points. Um, uh, there is a lot of discussion going on in that respect because we would also need this infrastructure on, uh, on European level. It doesn't help if it's only available in some member states. And the same would go also for hydrogen. I mean, also hydrogen is uh, uh, heavily discussed in the, especially in the truck area, be it hydrogen combustion engine trucks or fuel cell trucks. Um, uh, how do you see uh, especially investments here? And do you think the European regulator um, is on the right path here for these infrastructures? Because without the infrastructure, uh, that will not going to happen. Yes, you know very well that uh, we have um, decided on, on AFIR. Um, we had reached an, an agreement uh, on, on trilog level. This has to be uh, backed by a vote in July. And uh, we had 18 technical meetings and, and uh, five trilogues. And of course, you see that uh, in this, from this infrastructure perspective, we have 70% of the charging uh, stations in just uh, Belgium, France, Germany, Netherlands. And uh, it has, if it comes to cars, it has to be a European success story. We need this infrastructure rollout, pan-European. Uh, and this is even more difficult for the trucks. Um, the, the, the member states were not very um, enthusiastic about having binding targets. Now they have it. Uh, but I think uh, if, we have, if we go now too fast for electrification, uh, the truck sector, uh, we will not be successful in, in coming at the same pace with, with, with the infrastructure uptake. It will be very, really difficult. And um, in, in Eastern Europe, there was no willingness really to take those targets as, as binding targets because uh, the, the, finance ma the financing of this infrastructure um, has to be co-funded from the European side at least. And that is something which is difficult. As you know, if, you, if it comes to the Trans-European Network, we have difficulties in finalizing the infrastructure on the ground, and this will come on top. And uh, so this will be really a problem. And uh, the, the member states are just willing to really do this if they see that this is needed. And um, so it will be a long way to, to realize it 
and we have no additional sources from the European level. Uh, perhaps we can, from the recovery resilience uh, money uh, fund, dedicate something, but financing will be a huge problem for, for the infrastructure rollout. Uh, for the hydrogen question, we have um, a binding target each 200 kilometers um, around the Euro trans-European network. This should be sufficient, but it has to be established. That will take some years. All right, thank you very much on that. So I have one last question um, uh, because we know you need to run. Um, uh, MEPs are always busy. Um, so thanks again for being with us. Uh, Benedikt Rolfes is asking, do the politicians also take feasibility into account? How should we transport goods from Spain to Poland in the future without doubling the amount of trucks and increase the lead times and costs if, we own, if only electric trucks are allowed? Uh, and in addition to that, maybe in the last sentence, you could give us some hints on the timetable concerning the negotiations in the European Parliament. Yes, so we will not double uh, double the number of, of trucks. I think in the long run, we will have some uh, modal shift from from uh, the road to, to train. And in, in, in uh, visionary speaking, uh, in, in, in 10, in 20 years, there, there might be an option to have an hyperloop from Spain to uh, to Central Europe, uh, delivering tomatoes and oranges. This is something we should work on, but this legislation will come in, in October. So let's wait and see. Um, on the timetable, the Euro 7 will be discussed on uh, uh, Thursday here in Strasbourg. And we have the amendments next week. And in uh, the heavy duty uh, vehicles with Mr. Yado, uh, we will discuss it in um, September in uh, the ENVI committee. Uh, we will vote on those files in October, September. So this is a procedural, real crucial point. Uh, the Spanish people will not uh, discuss, uh, not, not um, negotiate it because of the, the, the elections taking place um, in autumn. Uh, so it will be to the Belgian presidency to finalize both files between January and March. And that, that is very ambitious, um, but uh, we should be optimistic. The best time uh, on earth in Belgium was when there was no, no government in, in Belgium. So perhaps uh, they can even finalize two files uh, in three months. <laughs> Keep your fingers crossed. <laughs> okay, we will do that. Um, thank you very, very much, Jens, for being with us. Um, it would be very interesting uh, to have some more discussions in the near future on this file. I think uh, this will uh, happen uh, also with uh, your colleagues from the other parties, which were unfortunately not available today. So again, thank you very much. Um, uh, of course, if you want to stay on, you can uh, listen to the following discussions, but I assume uh, we will fully understand when you have to leave and uh, go to other duties. Thank you Thanks very much. Thanks a lot. Have a good afternoon. Thank you. Thank you. All right, uh, uh, with that, um, some more questions we have already in the chat. Um, we go to our industry panel. Um, uh, we are very happy to have three uh, different uh, views. Uh, first, uh, from the fuels industry, from uh, our member Repsol, the Spanish energy company. Um, we have uh, Berta uh, Cabello with us. She is the director of renewable fuels at Repsol. Uh, actually a chemical and biochemical engineer by education, uh, working with Repsol for quite a long time, uh, more than 20 years. Uh, she joined the technology uh, center in 2001 um, as a process simulation engineer. Um, um, and she um, then uh, worked uh, her whole career, I would say, on uh, fuel solution, for, uh, different fuel solutions, and since uh, September last year. She is Director of Renewable Fuels. We know that Repsol has a very dedicated strategy on uh, uh, developed on renewable fuels, um, uh, especially renewable diesel and gasoline, sustainable aviation fuel, renewable methanol, biomethane, uh, and e-fuels in general uh, are uh, in Repsol's portfolio or in their strategic uh, goals. Uh, Berta, very, very, very nice to have you. Thanks uh, for joining us. Um, maybe you could, as a start, give us um, some overview on Repsol's strategy and plans uh, to achieve its goals. 
Hi, everyone. I'm really glad to be here. Thanks, Raf, for inviting me. Um, I will make a very brief summary of, about what we are doing. Um, our, our strategy is based on giving our customers um, the similar products to the ones that they are using now in terms of physical and chemical properties, but with a carbon neutral footprint. That's our, our base. And for doing that, what we are doing is introducing in our sites, in our current in industrial sites, uh, another raw materials different from um, crude oil and fossil fuels, uh, different renewable materials, uh, especially waste uh, from organic uh, origin, and also circular um, materials, plastic waste to produce circular materials, because we are also um, produce, we pr produce also chemicals. So at the end of the day, as I was mentioning, we try to supply transport or types of transport and also chemicals with uh, lower carbon footprint uh, products. And this is not new. I mean, we, we have been working uh, on this uh, for a long time. Uh, 25 years ago, we started producing uh, biofuels and all this experience uh, have helped us um, uh, increase our capacity uh, in uh, this production. And we have been pioneers, for example, also to produce uh, SAF. We started three years ago. Um, even before uh, having any regulation, any mandates in, in the country, uh, in order to test this product, we have also started producing hydrogen, renewable hydrogen from biomethane. And uh, we are testing with our customers 100% renewable fuels uh, products, like renewable diesel, in uh, transportation companies uh, in heavy duty to really uh, test that this is a, a possibility to to, to have 100% carbon neutral fuels in, in this kind of uh, transport. So this is, this is the present, but uh, we have clear target for the future. We uh, have an objective, a long-term objective uh, to be net zero in 2050, but we have also in the short term in 2030, very uh, specific objectives to show that this is a reality. We have objectives for renewable fuels, uh, 2 million tons per year, but also for hydrogen, that is also a raw material for uh, renewable fuels and also for circular materials that at the end of the, the, the day are also important to supply to mobility with uh, sustainable uh, solutions. So we believe in all different uh, technologies. And I think Jens mentioned several times, for us, it's really important. We believe that uh, electricity and hydrogen will be part of the mix uh, for transport, but we also believe that liquid fuels will be uh, part of the, of the solution. And for that, even inside liquid fuels, there will be very different technologies and we are working in all of them. Hydrogenation of UCO, for example, but also biomethane production, ethanol, gasification and pyrolysis of waste and e-fuels. Because at the end of the day, what we will do is um, take uh, advantage of all the waste that we have locally and also CO2 uh, giving uh, waste valorization opportunities and security of supply that is so important nowadays in, in, in Europe, everywhere, I would say. We will invest in new plants to transform this difficult uh, waste into something that can be fed into the sites. So we will create uh, employment. And also we will use the existing know-how or our sites, uh, giving employment stability, because at the end of the day, in some years, fossil fuels will not longer be there, but we have, uh, we are creating a lot of employment right now that we want to keep on. Uh, so that's very important uh, for us. So, well, we think that not only as Repsol, but as an industry, we are prepared to perform these um, investments. Uh, we have the engineering uh, capabilities, technology operation, and uh, we have the commitment uh, to, uh, base our uh, investments in low carbon investments. So we want to be part of the solution and for that, an open regulation, um, uh, giving a uh, room for all technologies is, is really important to make it possible. Right, thank you very much for this insight, Delta. Um, uh, maybe uh, one uh, buzzword, of course, is investments right now. Uh, it is clear that uh, the e-fuels, um, are not there. They have to be produced on an industrial scale. Um, and uh, for that, we would need huge investments. Uh, when I mean huge, I mean billions of investments into industrialized production. Now, I understand, of course, that uh, for you as a potential investor and producer, 
uh, the the market is important. So where do you get uh, basically your customers uh, for the products, and where did, do you get investment security uh, uh, for your uh, investors? Now concerning the CO2 regulation uh, on road transport in general, we have this discussion in Brussels that uh, people say, well, we will need those fuels for planes and ships because there there is no alternative. So let's electrify uh, the road transport sector. Um, uh, and spare those fuels, uh, so to speak, for, for the other uh, so-called hard to abatement sectors. Could you explain a little bit how this, so if we would assume we would go for this approach also in the truck sector, how this would impact your investment strategies? Yes, of course. Um, I think that uh, maybe investments based in mature technologies like hydro treatment or biomethane won't be affected but new technologies uh, are still under development or pre-commercial stage like gasification or e-fuels uh, of course they will be uh, at the end of the day um, they are the ones that are giving a solution for waste and also um, giving a lot of new employments but the risk to undertake these investments is much higher and without an open ground for road transport it would be difficult to assume uh, this risk uh, in fact, in the past, uh, road transport um, regulation is already affecting some of uh, investments. For example, you don't see a lot of renewable gasoline projects in Europe. Uh, and uh, in, right now, the demand for gasoline is increasing because of the sales decrease of diesel cars. And I think we are, we are losing an opportunity here to decarbonize uh, road transport uh, really uh, fast and, and efficiently. But um, nobody is thinking about uh, investing in renewable gasoline. So uh, at this point, somebody would say uh, the existing fleet, we need renewable fuels. Uh, so that's enough for you. And well, a uh, yeah, part of it, it's true. But uh, imagine uh, approving these high billions investments uh, with a provision in the landscape is not the same for our shareholders than having a healthy technology uh, competition. And to be clear, I, I was mentioning before, we are considering that road transport will be, especially light duty, will be heavily electrified. But it's not the same having a prohibition that a technology competition. Yeah, understood. Um, um, maybe connected to this, we also hear um, there will be never enough e-fuels for all the use cases, because there will be never enough renewable energy uh, available. Uh, so therefore we have to limit the use cases. That's the other angle of this debate. So basically a, the, the, the prediction of a, a long-term shortage uh, of, of uh, renewable energy and also uh, then e-fuels. What would you answer to that? Is that true? Well, that's a very difficult question. <laughs> What I could say is I that, uh, yeah, I mean, all the alternatives had its pros, pros and cons. I mean, electricity has also its limits, uh, hydrogen, also uh, e-fuels and also biofuels. But why then uh, limit the options? I mean, we need all of them. So let technology and let the industry um, analyze and evolve and develop the technologies and really see where are the limits? But if we predefine from a regulation perspective the options that we could use, uh, maybe we will find a limit for the others when it's, uh, there's no time left to promote the other alternatives. So I think the, the challenge is so difficult, the climate neutrality challenge, that we need to focus on leaving the engineers and technology developers and then we will see which part um, it, it will make uh, a point uh, to use uh, e-fuels, renewable fuels, or, or hydrogen. Thank you very much. I think with that, um, uh, we, would, we have already answered also one question from, uh, from the audience. We will come back to you later on uh, in another Q&A session anyway, but maybe one last question um, concerning the so-called fisher trop rule, because you are also in, involved into aviation fuel production. Right now, the only way to produce aviation fuel is via fisher trop um, And we know that with fisher trop you always have byproducts. Uh, maybe you can elaborate a little bit, explain what that means and what that also means for your investments again, 
because if you have the byproducts, then of course you have to do something with them. Yeah, of course. I mean, I'm a chemical engineer. You you mentioned that, and um, and unfortunately, um, it's very difficult to have a chemical process, not only fish chops, um, one hundred percent selective to a product, especially when we talk about hydrocarbons. So uh, normally you produce other things like naphtha or diesel. So depending on the final market for those byproducts, uh, sub price or sub cost will be will be affected. And, and that's clear. I mean, uh, technology will evolve and, and I'm sure we will reach a more selective process, but 100% once is, is really, really difficult. Additionally, I have to say that uh, we cannot forget that in the last 25 years, renewable fuels development uh, has been possible thanks to road transport. And that's thanks to that, now we are able to produce SAF in a most efficient way that if we would have started to produce biofits now. And, and short-term stuff production is possible thanks to road transport market. Let me, let me explain, for example, in our case, uh, in 2020, we took FID for our new Cartagena plant that will be ready at the end of the year. But the FID was based on road transport market. At that time, we, uh, we had no clear regulation for, for SAF and even with it, there is not enough volume in Spain uh, assured by regulation for a big industrial plant until well past 2030. So we took the bet to have that plant flexible to produce up, but it was a bet. And it's great because now we are in the position to supply the Spanish markets with uh, SAF from uh, next year. So it's great, but it has been the flexibility to supply road transport. The fact that that has made us take the decision and we will be able to supply SAF more efficiently because we have both options. So for me, that's uh, clear. We are having economy of scale because of those uh, two, two transport modes. Understood. Thank you very much. Um, as I said, uh, there will be a, a last uh, Q&A round also with Berta later on. Uh, but let me bring in now um, uh, Andrea Guerini. Um, uh, because, uh, of course, truck manufacturers are addressed by the CO2 targets uh, for trucks because it's always about uh, uh, new trucks. Uh, Andrea Garini is um, Alternative Fuels Representative at uh, the Iveco Group, which is also a member of the eFuel Alliance. So welcome, uh, uh, Andrea. Um, uh, Andrea is also an engineer, but in this case, a mechanical engineer from Politecnico di Milano. Um, uh, and he started as a research engineer at IFP, which is Institute for Sales to Petrol. Um, uh, and he worked on the development of uh, internal combustion engines fed with alternative fuels. So from the very beginning, actually, also um, uh, with, this, uh, with this business. Uh, then he moved back to Italy and joined Centro Research at Fiat, so the Fiat Research Center in 1997. Uh, where he took different uh, positions dealing with R&D programs, addressing again the engine technologies development and the use of alternative fuels. Since 2021, he has uh, he has been the uh, alternative fuels representative at Iveco Group, and he also is familiar with Brussels politics because uh, uh, between 2017 and 2021 he was secretary general at NGVA Europe in Brussels. Uh, so. Um, uh, quite a, a, a familiar face also concerning um, uh, Brussels politics. Uh, Andreas, thank you very much for joining us. And maybe also uh, with you, it would be very nice if you could uh, lay out for, for the start um, uh, and give us an insight on the vehicle strategy and how you um, uh, how is your vision for decarbonizing heavy duty transport? Yes. Thank you very much, first of all, Ralph, uh, and I'm uh, really glad to, to join the discussion and uh, provide uh, the, the standpoint uh, as Iveco Group. So I think that, uh, yes, in the previous discussion, uh, we already pointed out some important topics. First one, either I say the complexity and the diversity of uh, the heavy duty transportation system compared to what we have seen uh, on the uh, car and passenger side. Uh, it's a complex system we have to address from uh, urban delivery uh, mission to long uh, haulage uh, uh, freight transportation. 
So missions are quite different. Uh, we have, of course, as Iveco Group, uh, both uh, the, the truck side uh, and also the, the bus uh, division that uh, is also now, uh, let me say, will be covered also by the new proposal for the, the regulation. And uh, we have also to point out that uh, indeed uh, heavy duty transportation is part of the hard to abate sector. And this because uh, when you look to the current uh, contribution from this sector, you realize that uh, approximately 80% of the CO2 emission are coming from the so-called long old uh, truck. That's of course the, the truck that are running uh, maybe 120, 130 uh, thousand kilometer per year. So that of course uh, uh, consume most of the fuel from the sector. So producing automatically most of the CO2. So uh, with this in mind, we have also to, to consider the starting point. So today uh, uh, we have still a situation where last year, um, approximately 270,000 trucks sold 96% uh, still with diesel and a few percentage just on alternative fuel, a little bit of natural gas, also considering, uh, let me say, the crisis last year and the impact on the price of gas and very few parts of uh, full electrified solution for heavy duty. Saying that, uh, Iveco Group uh, uh, embraced totally, is embracing totally the, uh, the engagement for the carbonization. We were pioneer uh, in introducing uh, more than 20 years ago natural gas on our product lineup. That was also an easy way to start introducing also biomethane in the transportation sector. Today, Iveco Group uh, uh, is uh, fully developing a, a complete range, uh, trying to comply with the different needs of the market, uh, looking uh, for sure to electrification, full electrified solution, especially for urban mission. I refer, for instance, to light commercial vehicle, like what we have within our daily, uh, looking to typical mission up to 200 to 300 kilometer that can cover by electrified solution, but also, of course, looking to hydrogen uh, with fuel cell solution. And uh, today, as you already mentioned, also looking to internal combustion engines. That is also a very interesting player that has been also introduced by the, the review of the of this proposal recently in, in February. So we last uh, September, uh, if you were at the IAA uh, in Hanover, uh, you, you could really feel that uh, not only the group, but all the OEM are there investing in, uh, in uh, let me say, these new technologies. So uh, then there is the question, there is the big uh, but. So uh, all this will fly. And we know that uh, uh, all uh, these options uh, will be able to fly, uh, of course, if the entire ecosystem will be developed in parallel. So I refer expressly to what I've been already mentioned about the infrastructure uh, development. And once the infrastructure is done, also TCO, another important element for our business uh, already mentioned before is total cost of ownership. Uh, we saw in the past customer uh, choosing from one to the other technology just for a few percentage point of TCO over the entire lifetime of the vehicle. Today, what we know is that when we switch to future technologies and we compare to today's diesel or a natural gas solution, we can already have a multiplication factor by two. So we need also, of course, to, to work in parallel uh, with regard to the reduction of the overall total cost of ownership and of course, availability and compliance of all the solution with the real market needs. So I think that uh, this uh, is um, here for us to uh, remember that we need to have a pragmatic roadmap uh, when we look to the implementation of a new regulatory framework 
looking at all these elements. Because uh, what we see as a risk is that uh, we can, of course, uh, have and set more ambitious targets. But what we see is that this will be very dangerous if it, this just translates in, let me say, closing the robinet at tailpipe emission. Uh, because this is very risky. We, we just learned also uh, over the last uh, period how important is the resilience of a system. So what also Mr. Giesecke referred before about flexibility of the system, capacity to adapt. So we need anyway to multiply solution that can lead this sector, that again, it's a hard to abate one, uh, to really contribute to a decarbonization process. That's why uh, we are, uh, we were, and we are, and we will be <laughs> in favor of uh, full recognition of uh, the contribution that can come from uh, renewable fuels. Thank you very much, Andrea, uh, for this uh, um, initial statement. Uh, so then I would suggest let's go into the regulation. Yeah. Um, a little bit because there are also some questions uh, from the audience concerning that. Um, I mean, uh, first of all, maybe if you if you see or if you analyze the commission proposal as it is right now, um, I asked this question already also to Jens Giesecke. Um, yeah. The commission doesn't want to go down to 100% in 2040. They go to um, 90%, um, meaning uh, at least 10% uh, uh, CO2 tailpipe emissions will be allowed also in 2040. So would that help to what you just said? No, or to me, it's, to me yeah. it's, not, it's not the right angle. And to me, main concern uh, will be the next decade. Uh, we are in a urgency to provide solution to start decarbonizing from now. And uh, to rely on a system that can uh, bring in the system other solution rather than electrification and hydrogen. We know that uh, this will uh, be new technologies and all OEM are working on that. But the situation is that, as we have already discussed, we need uh, to build up infrastructure and this will take time. Uh, bring in uh, and we have to to keep concentrate on the next on the 2030 2035 target because uh, we are already concerned to be able to fulfill a minus 30 percent uh, uh, target to be realistic because this will not fly uh, you have seen uh, also the projection from uh, ASEA now looking to the need uh, of the adequate infrastructure to support the deployment of battery electric or electrically chargeable heavy duty vehicles and uh, uh, hydrogen fuel cell or whatever, or, or uh, internal combustion engine supported vehicles. We are speaking about uh, for 2030, the need to have more than uh, 2000 uh, uh, hydrogen refueling station delivering more than uh, two ton a day now all across the 10T network. This is a lot, it's a huge investment. We have seen in parallel, I can comment on this, uh, the timeline uh, we need to develop the LNG station. Today, we, we took almost 10 years to build up approximately 700 LNG new station across Europe to support the LNG business. Hydrogen stations are much more expensive. So we need to be realistic when we set target. Otherwise, it will be just a PowerPoint exercise. And this is extremely dangerous for the environment first, because we will miss the target and also for the industry. <laughs> and of course, for the, the entire uh, system. So no, I think that uh, this 10% uh, that is left uh, is uh, meaningless if uh, we really do not open uh, the regulatory framework to a real uh, technology open approach. This is the real question. And we have already, we have also several studies that are demonstrating that without the contribution also from the fuel side, 
uh, synthetic uh, uh, electrofuel, biogenic fuel, we will fail this, uh, this target. Okay, understood. So that, that would mean there has to be an adjustment of the Commission proposal. Yeah. Um, Jens Giesecke already mentioned there are several uh, proposals, so to speak, float floating around. Yeah. Uh, the so-called carbon correction factor or a crediting system. Uh, what would your preferred option here and how, how should that work ideally so yeah. that you, yeah. that you yeah. open up the regulation? Mm -hmm. Yeah, the question of course is to, to try and uh, move you know, from the simple tailpipe approach to something more comprehensive and more representative of the reality. So we, we uh, often uh, uh, mention uh, well to wheel approach or life cycle uh, approach. We know that this will be very complicated and complex to translate in, uh, in only one piece of, of regulation. But what is important is that uh, well to wheel and LCA consideration are the mindset behind uh, the, um, let me say, the, the, this regulation. So they need to reflect somehow. So looking uh, to a simple approach and uh, trying to maintain uh, the today tailpipe approach, carbon correction factor, for instance, is an easy way to go uh, because this is even relying also on what is already included in the Renewable Energy Directive uh, that is uh, somehow rewarding the combustion contribution from renewable uh, fuels as a zero, set to zero. So we can easily offset the tailpipe emission according to the ratio of renewable fuel that is introduced in the market. And by the way, that is uh, monitored by some tool, shares tool in particular, that has been introduced by, by the Commission expressly to monitor now the progress of renewable energy use not only in the transport sector but in, in uh, all other sector in order to get let me say this uh, um, reward of the so-called well to tank contribution and by fixing uh, let me say even uh, ambitious criteria for sustainability of the fuel we can uh, open let me say to a wide family of fuel that in the short term, medium term, long term, can contribute to the decarbonization of, of the sector. As Berta was pointing out before, is not up to the regulatory uh, framework to lock uh, option. We need to move into an open regulatory frame and then market will decide, countries will decide because not all the countries in Europe will run at the same speed, oh, the, the, the race for electrification and also the hydrogen infrastructure uh, realization. Now, this was also one of the outcome uh, from, uh, let me say, uh, out of the discussion uh, uh, about the AFIR, you know, that set binding targets that, of course, <laughs> was quite complex you know, to, 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 to identify uh, for all member states. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, quick last question in this round with uh, uh, maybe a quick answer from, from the audience. Uh, when you talk about um, alternative fuels, uh, which you would need, especially in the next decade, uh, are you talking about e-fuels or biofuels? I'm, I'm, I'm a technology neutral. <laughs> fuels neutral. No, e-fuels, e-fuels, now I, I, I speak, let me say, as an engine engineer, our, our perfect uh, solution because these are perfect drop-in solutions. So it, they are a dream. They are the perfect uh, uh, fuel that you can use in whatever uh, engine, uh, whatever fuel infrastructure distribution. So uh, when I hear discussion about the cost of the fuel and of if fuel is concerned about this, that is true. But we need again to have an ecosystem approach because by using eco fuel, we can skip maybe some investment on other infrastructure. Of course, e fuels uh, 
we know where they are. It's very interesting, both for uh, a diesel substitution and also gasoline. That is not the case for the heavy duty transportation side. We have anyway inside this uh, uh, family, hydrogen and emethane, so power to gas, uh, gaseous. We have also the gaseous side of, of a fuel that is of interest. But this is perfectly compliant with this pragmatic roadmap that must start from today availability of product like HVO, like biomethane, no? to start opening our mindset and looking to effective solution that all together can contribute to a full decarbonization of the sector. Yeah, thank you very much, Andrea. I think the last sentence was the perfect segue to switch to Dirk Seile. Um, uh, who is representing uh, the um, uh, BEL, uh, which is the uh, German Road Haulage Logistics and Disposal Association. He is uh, the head of the Brussels office and uh, a long-standing face actually in European uh, politics. Uh, I know him from my past when I was working in Brussels, so uh, very familiar with uh, the regulatory framework on transport, uh, but also, of course, on uh, climate uh, policies. Uh, Dirk studied political science in Berlin, Toulouse, and Bruges. Um, uh, and uh, he started um, uh, as a, an advisor to a member of the European, uh, uh, of the European Parliament. Uh, and already there, that was back in the 90s, uh, he was related to transport policy. Um, he briefly entered the management Brussels office when uh, then the company was taken over by Vodafone. Um, uh, and then Dirk uh, joined in 2001 um, the uh, BGL, as I mentioned already. Uh, since 2019, we found very interesting uh, part, uh, BGL joined forces with the Nordic Logistics Association, NLA, and also the French uh, Association, FNTR, and they have formed a joint uh, office in Brussels. So. That means uh, a real European approach. Dirk doesn't work only for the German BGL, but also for uh, his Nordic and his French colleagues. Um, and um, uh, with what you have heard, Dirk, from as well as fuel producers, as also uh, truck manufacturers and politis uh, politics uh, before, uh, what is your take on the CO2 uh, regulation? Um, and, and maybe you can give us a little bit of an insight about where your members actually are when it comes to decarbonization, what are the pressures and the problems, maybe also the challenges, if you will, uh, and how is this connected to this regulation? Yes, thank you very much. Um, and I heard a lot of uh, encouraging words and a lot of similarities from all the speakers that I've heard so far uh, and a lot of uh, things that we can agree on. But thank, let me just thank you first for the invitation for today to give us the opportunity to express our views and our concern on this um, major legislative file on the decarbonization of the road transport. Um, it is true, I'm representing also the road uh, transport office of the French and the Nordic Association. By the way, it should have been my French colleague, Isabel Mette, who speaks uh, at my place, but she had a prior commitment, so it, it, it was me. But I just wanted to add that all three of our associations, we are also part of um, the bigger world um, of the IRU, the International Road Transport Union, which is the association um, of the road haulage companies in the world. Um, if you ask me what does it all mean for um, the road haulage companies? Um, my association represents around um, 7,000 um, members um, from around 50,000 members in the total market in, in Germany. Um, in average, our companies own 13 trucks. So they are very small. And uh, if you look at the total market, you could say that 80% of our uh, road haulage companies have less than 10 trucks. And uh, close, um, and only 2% of all the um, road haulage companies that you see on the streets every day, they have more um, than 50 trucks. When you also see the same thing for the employees, it is basically the same. 50% of 
the road shortage companies um, have only up to five employees. One third of the road haulage companies employ six to 19 employees and only 5% uh, of the whole road haulage companies um, employ more than um, 50 um, people. And that is by far not a German particularity, but this is the reality all over Europe. So these are lots of figures, but um, maybe this was just one thing um, to retain from all these figures that uh, road haulage companies are small and medium-sized businesses, and they're basically um, a family owned. Why am I mentioning all these figures? Because you can read today the press here and there that there are companies already today that are investing heavily in zero emission vehicles. Um, almost every week, if you open the, the paper, you can read it. Aldi Nord just invested or added another 10 cars. There were there was a Swiss transport um, um, a company that even thought in a long-term strategy, 1,000 um, zero emission vehicles. But the big bulk, 80, 90%, um, or even more of the companies are small and they have to think twice before uh, investing into um, a zero emission vehicle. Um, because if they invest um, too early, they, that can mean bankruptcy. That is also true if they invest too late, that can also mean that they are out of the market. So you always look at what the competitor is doing. And the best thing in our business to do is to fly with the crowd. So um, if everybody is doing it, then the competitive factor is uh, getting better. But for the moment, it's the big companies that invest part of their, inter of their um, um, uh, fleet with uh, zero emission vehicles, but the small and medium sized companies are not doing it. And I just may recall uh, maybe one um, figure that is we are operating in a market with, uh, with a margin of one to two percent. So, but what are the influencing figures now and factors for our companies um, to buy? It? Of course, they have to make an uh, uh, analysis and Andrea from Aveco mentioned it, we doing lots of different services, uh, local services, regional, long haulage. Uh, many companies are mixing it up. So it's an individual um, um, decision by each company when it comes to do I invest today or tomorrow into um, the zero emission um, technology. When you look at the um, environment, it's of course um, the CO2 emissions at which we are looking. We are looking at the pollutants, but we are also looking at uh, factors of what we've already talked about. This is the life cycle. But we also have to look at um, the operational viability. What is the range of a vehicle that we can buy? What is the payload? Will it be reduced by the new technology? Will it stay the same? Can I act and plan my routing with the same flexibility as I have done that now. What is the technology? Is it durable as it is now? Is it less? Is it better? This is a highly uncertainty. The fuel infrastructure was mentioned uh, for the right um, purpose uh, several times. That is not in place yet. Driver acceptance is a, is a major problem. Evico um, has put a lot of LNG trucks um, on the market, but when I listen to my uh, companies, then I hear that the drivers are hesitating or uh, when using these LNG trucks because the infrastructure is not in place for everybody. And um, the drivers think more about um, where do I get my truck filled up rather than do it, are thinking about the tour that they are doing. So that is um, an acceptance problem that we will have to, to look at very straight when it comes to more zero emission factors. When we talk about local, uh, it's the toll systems, for instance, in these different countries that uh, can determine if I buy or not buy a zero emission vehicle. And of course, the costs are a highly important uh, factor for our companies to decide for the investment. The initial investment, and it was already mentioned uh, several times, uh, double, triple, quadruple times when it comes to um, H2 uh, vehicles, uh, what are the savings that you can make? Um, what are the driving restrictions that you are facing? Your access urban restrictions that you are living with, the toll system, the taxation of fuels. So there's a whole number 
of uh, factors that decide whether or not we will invite. And the comparative is what we have today. And today we are living in a very, very comfortable diesel um, world. And that is the benchmark for our companies. We've got no problems, but we've got the services, we got the, 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 the loading, we got everything. So that is the benchmark to um, guarantee that we can still provide our services to society uh, and to industry. Thank you very much uh, for this insight. Um, uh, very interesting. And I think also very important to remember the structure uh, of these businesses. Mm -hmm. I mean, we always see the big players um, around, but in fact, uh, a large portion of uh, transport of uh, goods is in the hands of uh, small and medium sized companies. Uh, now, to follow up on that concerning the CO2 regulation, I mean, um, of course, addressed are the truck manufacturers, but uh, if uh, we go for um, uh, a, a tailpipe approach with, uh, uh, so to speak, only electric or uh, uh, hydrogen solutions, uh, that would uh, impact uh, all your uh, um, uh, members uh, directly because at the end they are the people who have to buy and run uh, those trucks. So what would be your solution in terms of the CO2 regulation? Then maybe you can elaborate a little bit on that, what your take is, um, uh, how should it look like? Uh, because on the other hand, as you stated as well, as everybody in this, uh, uh, in this audience, in this, uh, on this panel, uh, we also need to reduce CO2 emissions. Yeah, there. Um, I mean, most of uh, what uh, our companies are looking for has been already said. We need a more technological, um, open approach that allows to kick in for each and every technology that is that exists to help uh, to get this uh, world uh, climate neutral and especially get the the whole transport world um, more neutral. Um, and there was mentioned this carbon correction factor that might be a solution to it, but uh, only looking at um, battery electric trucks, hydrogen trucks, or hydrogen as a combustion engine might uh, not be a snuff, especially these um, other fuels. We already have one big advantage that the infrastructure already exists. We only we can go to the pump station and get the hydrogen or e-fuels with it. So um, that is definitely one thing um, that should be um, regarded at uh, when we are looking at the um, debates um, on the CO2 standards. And uh, Jens Giesecke was giving us some hope that he's fighting for it, and uh, uh, we will join definitely in that. Um, there might be a second aspect that uh, we are looking for it, uh, that might um, reassure our companies, and that is that we may have to install a better monitoring system that gives us maybe once or twice uh, uh, a good report on where we stand now. Because we have all the um, targets, we will have the CO2 targets, but we also have the um, targets uh, from AFIA to build up the infrastructure. Um, but we do not know where we are really. Um, do, when we would like to see it maybe on once or twice a year and the commission would be good to report it maybe to parliament and to commission and to make it public and transparent. So that could definitely be um, a, um, a, a positive uh, sign to reassure our people to see, okay, infrastructure is building up and uh, you can invest in it now. It, it, it could really add up um, to help um, uh, our... Uh, the, the, yeah, uh, a third point that I hear very often from our companies is that's maybe less the CO2 standards, but in general, the whole environment of the Green Deal is to better incentivize um, the companies. The incentivizing scheme is already quite high. It's true with 80% of the additional cost, at least in Germany, but that is not true um, for all the member states in, in the European Union. Um, but the European Commission has um, introduced a lot of bureaucratic hurdles into this incentivizing um, process, which makes it very difficult. At the end, um, I know a lot of companies who are introducing a request to these incentives, and then two or three years later, 
and they still do not have their money. And if we want to ramp up um, the zero emission technology, we really have to speed up and accelerate the whole process and not get uh, stuck into really unnecessary um, uh, bureaucratic hurdles. It might be three points that could be added. Thank you very much for that. One last question. I mean, um, everybody agrees on we have to achieve climate goals. Um, I think also everybody would agree that this comes with a cost. I think it's an illusion to believe that this is going to be without cost. Now, um, one could say, okay, if if it's the fact that we that we need uh, decisions on technologies such as electrification, for example, mm -hmm. and if they are more expensive, then your members mm -hmm. have to pass it on to their customers, right? Because at the end of the day, mm -hmm. it has to be paid by someone and it has to be, in your case, your customers. What would you say to that? Well, that is absolutely true. Um, our companies have to um, give the costs on and it will come for a cost for the whole society. And it will be billions of euro that you have to add because the whole structure will mean a much more investment in our companies. And I've mentioned that figure of a margin of one or 2% are totally incapable of, um, uh, of, of taking the burden of that financial um, um, of that financial extra burden that we have to pay. So it will definitely be at the end, a cost that the consumer has to say. I think Jens Giesecke mentioned it uh, at the very beginning, that is maybe a point um, that needs to be raised um, even in a more stronger way um, to the politicians to understand that can also add up to inflation and uh, to the reduction of purchase power, et cetera, because it will be at the end, the consumer who will pay the additional bill. Understood. Thank you very much for that. I would like to uh, join, uh, bring in again Andrea and Berta for our last round. Um, uh, and um, maybe one question to Andrea first, uh, which also comes from the audience. Um, uh, first of all, you mentioned the carbon correction factor already. Um, uh, the question, the, the, the person who is asking the question is quite a long one, so I won't read all the uh, text there, but it's basically the question behind the business case. So why exactly would it be attractive for you as Iveco or for any other truck manufacturer uh, to have a carbon correction factor or any kind of other crediting system um, for the matter um, uh, included into this regulation? Yeah, <clears throat> the the rationale behind uh, uh, let me say a, a system capable to to recognize the value and the contribution uh, from renewable fuels is uh, exactly to to go and have a more robust regulatory schemes so able to fulfill the 2030 2035 target offering more option to the not only to the OEMs, but to the, the, the system, all the system. So that's that's the real reason. Because the the layout, let me say, uh, the design of the regulation today is looking uh, at uh, specific and fantastic, let me say, new technologies, but that uh, per se, they have the risk to fail because of what we just discussed. No, because all the enabling conditions that are so crucial no, to, uh, for uh, the, the success of, of the strategy. But that's why we, we need, uh, let me say, to introduce some uh, de-risking strategy to, to give more resilience uh, to, to the regulatory framework. Thank you very much for that. And maybe the same question also to Berta. Um, uh, why would be the car a carbon correction factor, for example, would be an incentive for you as a fuels provider? Wh where exactly is coming the incentive from? Uh, what would be the advantage there? Yeah, I think that um, carbon correction factor could be quite different from the crediting system. I mean, a carbon correction factor um, would be like... Um, harmonizing what we are doing as a fuel supplier with the red and what the um, our end users with the um, OEMs will take advantage of that. 
but in in the carbon crediting system would be opening um, more the option to use renewable fuels. I mean, maybe or could be complementary solutions to reach the best or the most efficient uh, TCO that are at the end of the day, um, the, the transport sector will, will need. So depending on the system, the 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 way to to that they will work and the the way that it, it will they will help comply with the objectives i think they will be different but the devil is in the details so i think we need to work and i think jan's um sent us a, a really clear message and i think that we need to work together to find the best way uh to make it work uh, because it's uh, we are represented here the three parts of of, of the solution, so I think it is really key that we sit and think uh, about the best way, not only the name, but the details about how the system would work um, to be beneficial to comply with the with the targets. Because at the end of the day, what we want is an efficient transport, mm -hmm. but with a lower footprint. I think that's clear for all of, all of us. Agreed. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So it's two minutes left uh, uh, for our um, for our event, uh, and with that, I would suggest uh, maybe the three of you can, uh, if you would, if you would jump into, let's say, December this year or February next year, um, uh, a decision on the CO2 targets would have would be made by then. Uh, what would be your major wish you would like to see in this regulation? Andrea, I don't know, maybe you want to start? Yeah, no, I think that uh, I, I would like, uh, as, a, as a vehicle grow, we would like to, to see, let me say, this more uh, pragmatic approach, as we state. And um, I fully support also what uh, Dirk was saying before, that we need, uh, anyway, in this uh, long run uh, towards a full decarbonization of such an important sector to fix uh, some milestone and checkpoint where uh, we really uh, understand where the system is going. If uh, infrastructure have been developed, which are the perspective about cost of the fuel of the energy vectors, and also, as uh, Dirk was also mentioning, how the, the market is reacting you know, in terms of acceptance also of these new solutions. So this, this would be, let me say, a very, very good starting point. Thank you very much, Dirk. Well, I would like to see that we get recognition for what um, we are doing when we are using, for instance, climate neutral um, fuels. Uh, in Germany, we will introduce a new toll system, which will add, um, which almost means a doubling. Um, but if we are putting in our engine a climate neutral uh, fuels, uh, there is no recognition at all. Uh, in the tolling scheme in, in Germany. And uh, I would like to see a solution where our companies get a recognition if they are already driving today in a climate neutral way. Thank you. And last but absolutely not least, Berta. For me, I would say exactly the same as Dirk. I mean, uh, the recognition of carbon neutral fuels um, would be the great to see in the regulation. All right, thank you very much. Um, thank you, uh, first of all, to our panel, um, uh, Berta, Andrea, and Dirk, uh, for participating and sharing your views. That was the first of uh, several events we will do in the next half of the year uh, around this regulation. Thank you very much, Monica, for uh, your introductory remarks, and especially also Jens Giesecke for being with us. Thank you, Algara Kasi, from our team who was organizing the event and especially also the preparation. And thank you, Jan Verhold, for the technical uh, support. Actually, it was the first time that we did that by ourselves. Uh, so for that, I think it worked very well. Uh, I wish you all uh, very well. Thanks for being with us. Thanks for your contributions and your questions. And hope to see you soon on one of our next events at the Infuel Alliance. Have a good week. Bye-bye. Thank you very much. Thanks, good, bye. Good, goodbye, thank you. Bye.